Hochschule to welcome to the morning session about open access to research and culture. In our session we have three talks. The first one will, by, will be by Jonathan Hutchinson and the talk is entitled Important, Importing Wikipedia Principles into the Cultural Institution of a Public Service Broadcast. It's up to you to give your talk. Uh, thank you. Um, just wanted to start quickly by saying thanks to the organisers of, uh, of the conference. It's a, it's a great opportunity to um, come into this environment and uh, present some of my research, which is coming out of my, um, my three-year PhD candidacy. Um, and just to, um, to uh, calibrate you all to the institution and, and how it all works, I'm part of the... Um, the Australian Research Council's Centre for Centre of Excellence for Creative Industries and Innovation, otherwise known as the CCI, um, and that's part of uh, that's a research institute as, that's part of the Queensland University of Technology. So we're based in um, in Brisbane, uh, Queensland, Australia, uh, but specifically I'm based in Sydney, um, researching the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, so the ABC. Um, so what, what I wanted to try and do today is take you through um, some of the, the emerging areas or the, the emerging results I'm finding from my research um, and to, to specifically place it back into the Wikipedia context, what I've tried to do is borrow some of the um, core Wikipedia principles and retrofit that over what I'm finding within institutional online communities in public service broadcasting. Um, and I'm specifically looking at a project called ABC Corp, which I'll define uh, as we get into it. Uh, and just listening to the, the conversations that were, were happening yesterday and um, during the course of the conference so far, there, there appears to be issues around actually researching or a, or a tension between researchers, the researcher and the research of Wikipedia. Um, and I've been using a, a methodology which I'd like to share back with all of you today, which, uh, which may... Um, highlight uh, an, an, an easier way of, of researching Wikipedia. Um, so these are the four areas that are, uh, today we'll be covering. So briefly looking at um, setting the, the, the landscape around peer production um, and the tensions that, uh, that, that appear within peer production within the institutional setting. Um, and how these are starting to, to transform form into institutional online communities, and I'll find that a little bit for, as we further as we get into it. Um, ABC Cool as open culture. Just I wanted to highlight what actually happens within this space and how it, how that uh, works. Uh, and then this uh, this concept of the, the cultural intermediary is the person who is essentially positioned uh, between the stakeholders engaging in cultural production within institutional settings. Um, and this, this, from what I've been gathering in the last day or so, this is not too dissimilar to the, um, the role of the Wikipedia. So, and that's what I'd like to do today, is to just um, give you some of my research and ask for feedback from you on whether you think this type of um, approach is similar to, what the, to, a, to a Wikipedian approach. Uh, so, we've already had a great definition from Benjamin yesterday on peer production, so I'll skip through that. I think we're all kind of, we know what we're doing there. Um, Bankler, though, he's, I just wanted to read this one quote from Yokai Bankler, um, which I think encapsulates how I'm positioning peer production within this research. Um, so, he suggests peer production is radically decentralised, collaborative, and non proprietary based on sharing resources and outputs among widely distributed, loosely connected individuals who cooperate with each other while relying on either, on either mark, well, without relying on either market signals or managerial commands. So essentially this is a group of individuals coming together to um, create cultural artifacts or objects that describe our culture um, without any uh, monetary return or no apparent return on investment for them. Uh, so if we look at online communities, they, they also tend to reject uh, a top-down hierarchy model of governance, and it's more of a, a flat hierarchical type of um, approach where meritocracy comes into play. Uh, and what we're seeing there is that people who are seem to be leaders in, the, in these areas are there because of their past performance or what it is they what it is that they know. Um, 
Then to just position that within a little bit further in the field, and if we look at Clay Sherpy's work around institutions, um, so he's got, he, he describes uh, there's four limiting characteristics of an institution, which tends to um, be contrary to, to the, the concept of peer production. And so what he suggests is that uh, there's, there's management, uh, there's structural costs, uh, within those, within these um, or, uh, arrangements, there's um, exclusion between uh, those who can manage and those who should be managed. Um, and because of this exclusion, uh, there, that essentially uh, creates a class base. So the problem, or one of the problems, is looking at this flat, open type of production model within an online community versus a very structured um, and um, a governed type of institutional model. So it's not all doom and gloom in this, in this arrangement though. Uh, and if I can refer to the work of uh, Max Weber, he suggests that um, you know, this sort of institutional model is, is good because it, 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 it position or it enables stability within society. Um, and he refers back to, um, uh, yes, yeah, he just, uh, he, he refers to um, stability in society. And if we couple that with um, the core principles of, of public service broadcaster, which are university of availability and appeal, provisions for minorities, education of the public, distance from vested interests, quality programming standards, program maker independence, and the fostering of national culture and the public sphere. Uh, we can tend to see there's a little bit of tension between those two as well. So, um, so the, the the clear problem that we have from this whole landscape of of, uh, of, in, of online communities within institutions is how to enable the community to actively engage in cultural production within the institutional setting, primarily without slowing it down or inhibiting it in any any way as well. Uh, so. The methodology that I've used over the past couple of years is ethnographic action research. Um, and this, it, it's the coupling of two, two um, research designs where ethnography has been uh, emerged in, a, in the environment for an extended period of time using participant observation as its core, core method. Uh, and then action research as well, which is, um, which is bringing uh, what's being researched or what's, what's, uh, what's emerging as a result and folding that back into the research project itself with the aim of A, improving the, the, uh, the group that you're researching and B, improving the, the, the quality of the research as well. Uh, so the way that I've been doing that is I've been in, embedded in, uh, in ABC Cool as the community manager for the past two and a half years. So essentially, um, I found that these two, these two methods uh, complement each other mm -hmm. over this time. So what I would be finding as an ethnographer and you know, interacting with the, the community members and being a, a poolie, so a poolie is a, uh, that's what they, they describe themselves as, if you're an actively engaged uh, contributor within this group, uh, you're a poolie. So I've been acting as a, as a poolie and finding out you know, things like language, um, uh, what symbols mean, uh, how to interact with other members, and what I found there, I was then able to fold into my role as the community manager. So that, that role there is um, essentially um, you know, interacting with, the, with the, the members, interacting with the institution, sort of position between the middle of the, of the, of the two stakeholders there. I'll go into further detail of that a, a little bit later. But um, uh, needless to say that, um, yeah, uh, it, it's, been a, it's been quite a complimentary um, methodology and, and that's something which we could talk about a little bit later as well in terms of research on Wikipedia. Um, the last few months I've also been incorporating uh, netnography a little bit which is a mixed method approach and that's introducing um, uh, standards sort of things like interviews, focus groups, surveys, that sort of stuff. <coughs> so this, this leads me to, the, to a, um, a definition of institutional online communities. Uh, and what, what these essentially are is um, an online community, which is not a free and uh, open governance style of online community. This is, de this is a, a group of individuals that are um, operating on a platform which is probably developed and resourced by uh, whoever it is that 
has developed the, the sun. Um, and with that comes a, 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 a set of rules, I guess, that you know, participants in these online communities have to, have to follow. Uh, so that it's definitely, it's, it's not, a, not a, um, a completely rigid style of, of governance and it's not a completely open style of governance. It's, it's, it's a new sort of model which is starting to emerge, I think. Um, and examples of that is um, uh, John Banks has done a lot of work around the gaming communities and he's, uh, he's got a specific example around Warren Games, which is, he, he spent a lot of time as an economographer in that space as well. Um, and what he found is that uh, people contributing or, or producing cultural artifacts in that space, um, it's essentially to benefit their, their experience within you know, the end product, which is the game. So involving those people in the, pro in the development and the production of the, of the final outcome is a, was a good thing. You know, it's taking it, taking it to the masses and, um, and uh, you know, trying, to, trying to improve the process for all. Um, with that also comes a new form of, of governance model as well, which I'll talk a little bit about further. Um, now I'd just like to introduce you to ABC Pool. Um, I'm imagining that no one's heard of it before. Uh, so <coughs> it's, a, it's a site that was um, uh, developed and resourced by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. And, and the concept was to try and lower the barrier for participation of um, of um, audience members, I guess, that they could then engage in the production of broadcast outcomes. That was the, that was the impetus, the, the thought behind uh, getting ABC Pool together. Um, it's, it's used in a, in a number of ways. Uh, one would be just to store you know, media online somewhere. Uh, another is to interact with the members that are part of the, the community, so engage in conversations, forums, chats, that sort of thing. Um, there's also another, another function of ABC Cool, and that's where we start to see projects, which is a grouping of, of media around a specific thing. And individuals can create projects, or um, the ABC staff can, can create projects. And when we see this sort of um, dynamic start to happen, um, we start to see users engaging in what might be classified as co-creation, where there's a share of knowledge between, or an exchange of knowledge between what would be considered the expert in this arrangement with the, the audience member who arguably is not an expert, but quite often you, you find that they are. Um, so um, a, a, a nice example to, to think about in, in ABC Pool is, is a project that's designed by an ABC producer. For example, Radio National is one of the um, national broadcasting programmers. Um, and they quite often do long form feature documentaries or 360 documentaries, they, they create these programs. Um, and they might come up with a theme like um, uh, birds, for example, and then they send a, a call out to mobilize the, the audience members and contribute their work back on anything related to birds. Um, and this is an actual project that was, that was done, Birdland. Uh, was really quite successful. All of those contributions come in. The producer then comes in and, and uh, applies their skill and craft to it, um, and massages it out to become uh, a 53 broadcast, 53 minute broadcastable um, program. Um, what we see there is a really nice exchange of knowledge between someone who knows how to do this form of feature making. Um, and they bring their style of uh, uh, expertise to the table whilst engaging with a, a really large group of users who, you know, they're tapping into the collective intelligence here. And they're bringing new ideas and new themes and um, new production techniques. And so when these two come together, you could arguably say that it's a, um, it's a, a really dynamic and, uh, and, and great thing. So just coming back to that <coughs> controversial or tense area between you know, this open, open style of production and the governance of the institution, a really good case study, and you can read, I'm just going to skip through this today, but you can read more about that in detail in the paper that I've got. Um, this particular artist contributed a, a whole body of work to ABC Pool that was remixing a, a controversial um, disc jockey in Australia. And he, he re reworked him into a way that was um, where he was saying things which he probably would never say, but kind of what the, what the general populace was thinking he's, he's realistically saying. Um, 
And it was, it was really quite controversial for, for our ABC pool. We weren't entirely sure what to do with it, so we had to unpublish a lot of this content and seek advice from our legal department. Um, to our surprise, they were very supportive of this, um, and essentially came down to a risk management case where they said, should this case go to court, uh, do we have a, an argument to support it? And they found that uh, out of the 12 pieces that he had published, eight of them he could have on, on pool, but the others were just too obscene. Um, so that's just kind of a, it's a, it's a, a really fast introduction to some of the areas which are um, quite uh, contentious within this, this open institutional arrangement. Um, what I wanted to really try and concentrate on today though is this, um, the, the, the idea of Wikipedia principles. Um, Atta Bruns, he's my supervisor, so I think I, I, I get some gold points or gold stars for, for using some of his pro-usage theory in my presentation today. Um, but what I really wanted to concentrate on was these four key areas that, that he, um, he, he observed in Wikipedia. Distributed workload, granularity in the editorial process, increased level of ownership and absence of the gatekeeper. So as we've seen in Wikipedia, the distribution of the workload um, encourages more people to, uh, well I guess the, the rate of the material which is, is contributed is, is greatly increased. Um, something similar between ABC Pool. Uh, the granularity of the editorial, poly, uh, editorial process. Here we see that um, you know, everyone's an expert in their own field I guess, or in their own world. So particularly, you know, that's, that's been seen in, in Wikipedia, but if we bring that back to ABC Pool, we are uh, we see that you know potentially there's there's more interesting stories to talk about than what the national broadcaster might be might be talking about now. Increased level of ownership. The people who are parts of these online communities, namely ABC Cool, are extremely passionate about who they are, where they are, and what they're doing. Um, they defend the, the project to the death, um, almost to the point where ABC Cool was facing a decommissioning stage a, a while ago. Um, and the, the funding was, um, was uh, ceased from the, from the ABC and, um, uh, and the, the project itself continued going purely on the, on the strength and the, of, the, um, of the, the community members. This last point here though, absence of gatekeepers is a, is a unique one and that's a really interesting point I think I want to explore, explore a little bit further. I don't exactly think there's an absence of gatekeeper uh, but I think there, there's a new form of gatekeeper. Um, we've already spoken about that, and I wanted to bring you, your attention to this concept of the community manager. And so, this person is someone who's traditionally there to um, uh, encourage and foster and engage with the community members, and in these institutional examples, act as a representative towards the towards the institution for the um, for the uh, community members. So out of my, uh, my, my first 12 months of, um, of uh, participant observation in ABC Pool, this is pretty much what I found. So here's the, the, three, the three key stakeholders, pool participants, pool team, and ABC's institution. This also indicates the, uh, the flow of communication between, between each stakeholder. Uh, and in these, um, these overlapping areas, potentially what the what the core task that might be happening between those between those stakeholders. Position within the middle in an idealised situation as a community manager. And the concept is, is that as they're interacting with each of these stakeholders, they're taking the concerns and interests of the other two with them. Uh, so that's the, the basic one there. <coughs> How I think we can expand this, this concept, and this is where we start talking about Wikipedia, uh, is the is the is re reconstituting this concept into the cultural intermediary, which is someone who is concerned with the production of symbols and languages within the institutional setting, who is also uh, concerned with uh, the differences between the highbrow and the popular culture art scenes, um, and the blurring between work and leisure. Uh, and I think we might be able to retrofit this type of model, or this, this theory or this concept that I'm, I'm trying to develop into something which is kind of useful for other industries, um, including Wikipedia. So if we, if we um, substitute out particular titles, 
You know, you're looking at UGC contribution, the site operation, and professional cultural production. That's I think that's that's pretty close to what's going on in Wikipedia. Cultural intermediary, potentially Wikipedian, um, and then the core task, which is coming out of there. Uh, so that's pretty much what we've been talking about today. Um, what's, what's going on, peer production, challenging industrial models, institutional and communities, the tensions, and how this model could be useful for, for other industries. Um, that's the point where I think I'll stop and ask for your interaction on that. Um, there's my email address, Twitter handle, if you'd like to contact me and if there's any further things after today or whatever. Um, and that's my presentation for today. Thank you very much for your talk. Questions, please, or comments. It's very one in the morning, whether you have like a question. Please. Yeah, I don't know, but, um, I have two questions, and I don't think they're related, but uh, first of all, how would you resolve conflicts that might appear in this high visual model? Yeah. And second one, how do we encourage participation? Sure, okay. Um, so we've been asked to repeat the question. So the first one was how do we resolve conflict? Um, generally, what we, what we try to do is we understand each of those stakeholders. So I'll just come back to, to this, uh, this model here. So uh, this person situated within the, within the set here understands each one of those exceptionally well and how, how they operate and what their interests are. So when conflicts, are, conflicts arise, which happens quite often on a day-to-day -day basis, from you know little little discrepancies to you know quite large mainstream, probably a, a great example of something something which happened, which was quite quite big. Um, it, it's a negotiation process, and um, there's a there's a term we can use called interactional expertise, which is all about negotiation um, and looking at. Uh, you know, the best interests of all of those stakeholders and trying to, to and fro between the two, really acting as that intermediary between the two, uh, the two stakeholders. And uh, most times coming to a, a consensus, um, in times when there is no consensus, the, the institution rule is, is the way to go. Yeah. And what was the second question? Uh, how do we encourage participation? How do we encourage participation? Uh, so, we found that, um, actually there's, there's a few ways we can come at this, at this question. One is to say that um, an incentive of some sort is, you know, that could, be, that could be something which encourages participation. So, in those radio national examples that I gave before, um, you know, a broadcast outcome. So, taking a, a production of a, of a, you know, someone uh, a, a, an, an emerging media maker, and then saying, "Okay, we'll take your work and we can put it onto, you know, bigger stages for for broader audience." Um, that's one way. Um, another way is just to to try and lower barriers of entry, um, and that can be, you know, everyone's got a, a story to tell, so a common sort of starting ground, uh, and then the medium as well is quite important in this. In this Type of environment. So we found that you know textual contributions are, are really common. Audio, oh sorry, photography is the next big one because we all tend to have mobile phones now with cameras, so that's a really fast and easy way of doing it. Uh, audio is a little bit more harder, and video is probably the hardest. So you know, thinking about thinking about the user and how they might position themselves within this whole um, arena is, is not working. One more question, please. Comments? Here to pose a question, otherwise I will do that. And um, my question would be uh, about the media prints that we have on the phones. Um, and they are very nice, but my question is, are they real or just desired? What would you say? Um, I guess, and that comes back to what we were talking about yesterday, the research and the research, and there was a really nice bit of debate around, you know, buzzwords, I guess. And, and people throwing around terms in, in relation to Wikipedia. Um, for me, they were like, they were useful lenses to use in trying to get some sort of analysis out of the out of these two projects. 
how useful they are for the Wikipedian or the Wikipedia community, I'm not entirely sure. And that'd be, I guess that'd be kind of nice to, to go a little bit further with some research and um, yeah, ask that question. One more question, please. Matt? There's no question. Thank you again. Hello, everybody. My name is Dalit Kemo, and I'm from Haifa University. I'm actually from the Haifa Center for Law and Technology. I'm the legal supervisor of the uh, Law and Technology Clinic there. And today, uh, we'll talk about Gold and Green Model and Open Access Solution. Question mark. And uh, first, but first, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for letting me just deliver this uh, lecture. So, in order to keep on schedule, we have to start. Uh, as we all know, the access to career art is essential for the development of the science and is necessary for the academic culture. Publication are an essential and important vi and vital part of the academic life. When the internet era arrived, more and more academic journals were offered for sale online. A new business model was established in which one can buy an article and just pay for one article instead of buying the whole volume. Another possibility is to purchase access for the whole database instead of just for buying one, one uh, journal or one volume. These business models, based on copyright regime, lead to limited access to academic outcomes. Most of the publishers hold more than one journal. Usually, they control hundreds and even thousands of journals. Furthermore, they raise their fees without any proportion to inflation and make it impossible or inefficient to purchase just one journal. Instead, you are obliged to buy tight packages of several journals, even if you don't really need them. The rising costs of access to research outcomes might cause real damage to the scientific development. In the last decades, we have witnessed academic rebellion against the traditional publishers. The climax of the current rebellion took place in February 2012, when the mathematician winner of the Field Medal, Timothy Gowers, Organize a boycott of Alzheimer. Alzheimer is responsible for more than sorry for more than two two thousand scientific journals. In his website, thecostofknowledge.com, Gowers explains the motivation for the boycott, as you can see in the slide. More than twelve thousand people, academics, have protested against Alzheimer and signed Gowers' petition. Another petition at the whitehouse.gov uh, requires, as you can see, free access over the internet to scientific journal articles arising from the taxpayer-funded research. This petition was created in May 2012 by the Access to Research movement. As you can see, in June 2012, there were over 25,000 signatures already on this petition. Due to the problems already mentioned during the last decades, we have witnessed also new models of publication. It arrived from the idea of open access. Today, we have two main models of the open access publishing, the green model and the gold model. In the green model, the researcher publishes his article by depositing it in an open uh, access repository. Uh, usually in the institutional depository or the researcher's online website. In the gold model, the researcher publishes his article in an open access journal and usually has to pay a certain fee. The certain fee can reach the amount of $1,500 US dollars and sometimes even more, as reported in other articles. Due to the time schedule, I will not discuss the rising of the new models. You can read it in my paper, but we will just skip this section and uh, just go to the barriers created by the gold and green model. The gold model has some problems. 
few of the problems are mentioned in this slide, uh, and the first one is the high price, as I mentioned before, the researcher has to pay for publishing his article and keeping his article open for the readers. Another problem is that there might be an incentive for the publisher to publish an article regardless of its quality. That means that articles may be not that good, but the publisher wants to gain some profit, so he will publish it as well. Another uh, problem that mentioned here is the publishing process might be slow, just the same as in the traditional uh, publishing process, due to the process of peer review, then uh, in correcting the article according to the peer review, then linguistic uh, editing and then technical editing, and it takes a, lot of, a long time that writing the article and to publish it, sometimes even a year. Uh, lack of reputation. Some of the open access uh, materials are not, uh, did not gain a good reputation yet, but some did already. And the last one is the expenses to gain access to articles actually shift from the library to the researcher. And actually it remains the problem of the institution budget. As for the green model, the green model has also some faults. The green model, uh, in the green model, all the not all the articles are peer reviewed. And another problem is that there is also lack of reputation or guarantee of the high quality of the articles. Another problem is the stability of the repository is not always uh, guaranteed. Sometimes websites can be disappeared and sometimes repositories will be just shut down. In the information overflow um, area, we can just uh, experience some problems with locating an article in the internet, especially if it's not a thematic repository or if it's not orderly in order or some, some kind of order inside the repository. We shall now examine strategies for removing barriers to these uh, faults. In order to overcome the gold model problems and in order to encourage researchers and journals to join open access publication, there are calls to establish institutional repositories and encourage scholars to publish articles in them. In other words, there is a call for, for an institutional green model. While in this strategy, the institutional green model strategy, may answer the obstacles created by the gold model, it suffers from the problems that were mentioned before as a green model. Another strategy for removing barriers was created by the International Creative Commons Organization. CC assumed that it would be impossible to completely abolish the old models, at least in the meantime. In addition, CC assumed that many researchers are not aware of the meaning of the condition listed in the journal publishing agreement. To avoid these researchers uh, to formulate new clauses, CC created Scholars Copyright Addendum Engine, as we all know. This engine can create those clauses, not leaving it for the researchers. The new addendum can be sent to the journal as part of the contract between the journal and the researcher. The offered addendum generally reserves the possibility of providing access to studies by researchers. Every addendum gives the writer non-exclusive right to create derivative works, duplicate and distribute as long as it is done by uh, or in academic activities. There are a few possible addendums. As you can see in the slide, the addendum of access reuse, addendum of immediate access, and the last one, access delayed addendum. This proposal of CC, uh, although it is a good one, helps researchers to maintain accessibility to the research uh, they did, but it has some problems. A major problem with the solution of Creative Commons is the fact that young researchers do not have a great ability to change their agreements with the publishers. 
Therefore, it is highly if a right if forgive me. Therefore, if a highly ranked um, publisher offers you to publish your article in his journal, and it's a very high ranked journal, probably the young researcher will accept this offer regardless regardless um, the um, regardless the terms and even at a price that the publisher will not accept the terms of the proposed addendum that you send them. MIT offers a solution to the latter problem. The institution pr uh, supports the researcher through the international institutional mandatory request to publish the article in open access. For that purpose, MIT created an addendum called MIT Copyright Amendment. It can also be found on the uh, Scholar's Copyright Addendum engine. Similarly, University College London announced an open access policy in May 2009. Under this policy, UCL reserves the right to publish its scholars' researchers uh, in open access. The researchers themselves have responsibility to make sure that this open access policy is preserved by the publishers. The access reused, immediate access, uh, and the delayed access, and the MIT amendment agreement suggest a solution to the green and gold model uh, variants. However, the ability to negotiate with the publisher to adopt these addendums depends on the reputation of the institute and the reputation of the researcher himself. A new possible solution that I would like to discuss now and I would very much like to hear your comments about is uh, a new possible solution that will overcome the barriers and will be relevant to all institutions regardless of their reputation is the creation of the peer-reviewed repositories. The peer-reviewed uh, stage is done by scholars, as we all know, free of charge, as part of their academic duties. Therefore, we can use this stage and we can use the in, uh, internet and the facilities of the academic institutions and create thematic repositories for all the universities that are interested to collaborate. The peer review can be done by talkbacks, and here we just going into Wikipedia a little bit, added at the um, article page, or as we call it in Wikipedia, the talk section, actually. The review process can be done anonymously or by name, just by registered and approved researchers in the same field. Others will be able to uh, comment as well, but as an outsider or an outside observer. One might argue, as you did before, that we are, uh, there are no incentives for the researchers to review their colleagues' articles in this model. A possible solution for your question before is to um, create an academic uh, duty to review at least four articles per year. The review number can be counted by the repository itself. When the researcher uh, delivers a review uh, through his personal account in the, at the repository, with credit or anonymously, the counter will be increased by one. In the academic promotion committee, it will be mandatory to hand over a certification from the repository that the researcher reviewed at least four articles per year in order to get the desired promotion. In addition, only researchers from the university that collaborate in the repository will be able to publish their work there. Others will have to get a permission from the repository manager in order to preserve the quality of the repository. The thematic repository will uh, make the search of articles easier. As mentioned, it's a problem nowadays when we have overflow of data. The institution will invest less money to preserve and run these repositories than it pays today for the publishers. Thus, the article will be published immediately, and the quality and reputation will be preserved by the delayed online peer reviewed like in Wikipedia. The original author will be able to update the article in light of the comments, and at notice that the article has been modified will appear. 
In this way, the academic institution can avoid the middleman, can avoid the publisher, while preserving all the benefits of the traditional publishing. And they can also reduce their expenses, though we have to bear in mind that there are new ones, especially at the stage of the establishment of the repository and the, in the maintenance process. As to sum up, uh, as we saw today, the gold and green models suggest an alternative to the inter uh, traditional closed publication. However, while this model suggests a solution to give open access to research outcomes, they create new barriers, as we discussed before. I try to offer some strategies to remove the new barriers while preserving open access to research outcomes. At the end, I suggested a new solution that, in my view, can solve the problems and create new and improved open access green model. I would like to thank you all for your attention and I would like to hear comments and uh, questions, if not now, maybe in the top section of this uh, conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. Questions, please. Uh, I don't really have a question. just wanted to say that I have proposed a breakout session on the Wikipedia journal, which would basically be very similar to what you've just proposed. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm open to discuss that. Um, I like the idea. Um, what you propose is basically an archive uh, for any discipline. And we can uh, talk about things like whether it's really necessary to have four reviews per year. For instance, the new journal PJ just requires one review per year. That's things to discuss, and I invite you to come to that breakout session. Okay, uh, just to repeat it in the break breakout session, there will be a talk just similar to my uh, lecture about uh, how to use some kind of archive, like uh, uh, Wikipedia archive, maybe. Uh, for scientific uh, outcomes and scientific research. Yes. Um, I was wondering a bit of, about whom you are talking. You talked about in institutions, you talked about young researchers who wants to open up and publish their um, research. I do like very much your discussion. However, I think still that a lot of researchers rely on the web of knowledge. So how the idea of peer, you want to kind of reorganize the peer review process. So the question is how the reorganization of the peer review process is combined with the reorganization of acknowledgement of this kind of peer review. Okay, uh, the question, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I suggest a new peer review uh, process and the question was uh, how does this process uh, will influence the quality of the papers or uh, get the acknowledgement of the writers? That was the question. And no more rather, how will this be an incentive for young researchers to really publish? Okay, um, how, what, what incentives does this process give to young researchers to just publish their article? I think that in the internet era now, we publish online. And if we publish online, we can get comments, regardless the reputation, regardless uh, the name or the country that we are wor working in. So I believe that if young researchers will publish their article online in these repositories, they will get maybe some feedback from uh, highly ranked professors all around the world, regardless their reputation. I hope that maybe, maybe a new um, rule for just um, peer review is to take a new or a young research, uh, researcher research to just um, be peer, being peer reviewed by an older professor. Maybe it's a duty that the older professor has to take in mind and to just review new research of young researchers. So maybe we should just update my um, suggestion and add another duty of the older and highly ranked professors to review the younger one. Next question, please. Um, I would like to add to that because also in your paper you, you write that the quality and the reputation will be preserved by the delayed peer review. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think that's not how reputation works um, in, 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 in the journal uh, world, at least in, in my discipline, in management, business, and also in economics, uh, it is the same. Because uh, reputation is not just uh, generated by peer review. It's, uh, there are several dozens of peer review journals, but they are not very reputable. And that's another issue. What, what, is, what makes really journals reputable? It's the editorial board, it's the rejection rates, it's how difficult to get in. That's what, what makes reputation. Yeah, we can, I, I'm not saying that that's good and fine and that's as it should be, but that's what, in a way, uh, I have to get there to get m not only my promotion, but even to stay in academia. And um, I would have, no, I would not, never publish my best papers in such a repository because they would be lost for, for journals that I need uh, to get third party funding, to get, to get my job, to keep my job, not even to get, but to keep my job. And, and so I, I think uh, it's not just peer review. And, that, and I was wondering whether uh, you should a little bit more discuss, for example, the successful open access example of the Gold Road, such as Biomed Central or, or Plus, not Plus One, but, but uh, the Plus journals, the A journals, because what, why did they work? Because there are uh, Nobel laureates and they are in a way donating their reputation to the journal, and this, the journal then hands it over to the, uh, to the contributors. And I, I don't see how this should work in this model, the reputation. That's, that's really the problem. The, the, the rest, I think, is... Okay, so let me rephrase your <laughs> question. In one um, sentence, yes. Yeah. In one <laughs> sentence, yes. Uh, you say that uh, peer review is not the only uh, way to gain uh, reputation. Reputation is gained by the uh, editorial board of the journal and by um, uh, professors with high, name, with qu uh, high quality uh, papers that are published in uh, the journals. And who select the reviewers? They uh, select the review yeah, themselves. That's, that's yes, yes, that's important. Uh, they send, as we all know, they send our articles to a selected group of uh, researchers, and the researchers are they give their uh, outcomes and comments on the research. I believe that this is the traditional model, but I want to assume that this traditional model will, ju will just change into a new one. I'm trying to say something that Creative Commons did not say and they were right. In the meantime, we cannot abolish the publishers and we cannot keep this stage. I believe that in the, in the new repositories, we will create a new tradition that highly ranked professors, selected professors, will be at first uh, just peer reviewing all the articles not all of them, of course, but some of them. And I hope that this repository will gain reputation by, its, um, by registered professors that will comment there. And you will be able to see who comments on which article. So if a highly, um, a highly known professor will comment on a young researcher, probably everybody will else will read this article. So the article will gain reputation, not the journal will gain reputation. And I agree, they in, the, in the committee of promotions, we have to hand over some uh, papers that we published in high-ranked journals. I hope that this will also change. I hope that the promotion will be uh, by reading all the talks and all the feedbacks that the article uh, was um, getting in the repository. So, I know that I'm a little bit radical, <laughs> and I know that perhaps this idea will not succeed, but I hope that it will. What, uh, may I add one sentence? Follow up, uh, yes. Be because I think the, the most interesting thing for you to, to expand on, I would suggest, would be on how this transition <laughs> would be possible, because I, that's where I see the problem. Uh, uh, okay, there are several other practical issues, but this is only okay. This is not my case, but this is only available. But the question that I and I don't see uh, how you could convince these professors that are on the editorial boards. You know, it's not that they have nothing to do. On the contrary, and and, and why should they do that? And how could you convince them to do that? And okay, uh, of course you can answer this now, but I think maybe this would be even the more important thing. 
maybe I will not be able to answer it now because I'm just working on it. Oh, okay. So thank you for your comments. I will talk uh, just to repeat. I will talk about the transition from the traditional model to the new model in my work. Yes. I would also like to add that six uh, years if you need very very many reviews, it might be even the case that more than in the traditional model that we know to date. Plus one and so on, and we have the end. Bring out journals. People would need to make reviews. It's certainly an ideal state that demands that those people have a lot of time. You know, how difficult it is to write a review. I'm a little bit unsure whether we will really get those people spending that time to make more reviews mm -hmm. than they do so far. So, how can you dream of such a situation that this could become real? Okay, um, just rephrase the question. Um, what incentives do researchers have uh, to comment on articles? I, more than today. More than today, of course, more than today. I think that one solution, as I mentioned before, is just to uh, mandatory ask them to do this. And in order to get promotions inside the academia world, you will, be, you will have to bring a, some sort of certification that you did review some kind of, some amount of articles. I think that at first it will be compulsory. So that's the best um, suggestion that I can make now, but I'm thinking of another solutions, maybe uh, by adding another um, condition that the highly ranked professors just will have to review two articles, but of young researchers, so the researchers will gain more reputation. There was one more question, please. No, it was not a question, it was more a remark that then make the professors dependent on these reviews for their future funding, and this is how we make them do it. Okay, just a comment that um, we can force maybe researchers to comment on articles or uh, raise their reputation by forcing them to just hand over to funders um, a certification that they did so. So that's a good mark. Thank you. There's still time for questions or comments. Any more questions? If not, thank you very much again. Sorry, I actually got how to work with those machines. That's, <laughs> 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 uh, I think, the biggest pearl, not a promise, it's a pearl of, of the max, right? They make you completely disabled <laughs> to move to. So, um, when it's time, it's time to relax, and then it's time to get plenty of time for my relax, wait, and then it's time. I go quickly for the presentation, so we can hear even more. Uh, any time for this question, I would really like to hear your opinion. Any feedback questions? Uh, maybe I could just uh, speak in on the discussion that we just had, because I'm involved with a uh, one experiment that should be simulated in it's called uh, Topic Pages at cross Technology, uh, where we are uh, inviting people to, to write reviews of a particular topic. The review is written according to the normal standards of the journal, but also according to the standards of the English Wikipedia. And once they are, and it is being reviewed uh, according to, to both standards. And uh, once the article gets published on the journal, it also uh, gets published on the English Wikipedia, and then you can live on that. And uh, this model was started just in well, April, I think, or so, with the first publication. And now we're currently uh, reviewing uh, quite a few new such articles, so that's one way to make people familiar with the transition. <coughs> It seems to me that we have now the, the first revolution starting from those uh, journals from the community today. These are the other journals, which will be open access journals. And we are still in the course of having this revolution before we might do <coughs> the future the third kind of publication process. And from my point of view, there are so many scientists who really need to have this uh, publication of the impact factors, for example, of the 
journal papers and that they publish. I don't know many friends of mine who put this information on the website and you can run through the sums of the impact factors and how this the audience, for example, the applications for that of the funding or when they apply for the question and something like that. And then this information is very important. So both uh, need to have something like an impact factor that can be combined with such a journal phenomenon. And to get that is rather hard. We know that POS1, for example, is a very high impact factor right now, more than four points at least or so. And um, there's many, many other open access journals with an impact factor more than one or so, I don't know. Uh, but this, of course, takes some time before this is completely valid to the community. Okay. I think we have a short question. And I was going to write down that. You would like to set up a password. Okay. Do we get the couple links? Not at all. Do not take the links more. Be patient. This is master. We had to learn how to master patients in the day and the world. My students, they want everything.
And this is overview of the presentation of today. So I would like to start with the scope of the analysis and move to uh, my methodology and I will share the findings and the contributions. To start with, um, my scope was the intersection between web and memory studies and there is a certain gap into the way uh, social web applications and platforms impact memories. And my question, or a sub-question, especially in cases for Wikipedia and Wikia, was does, to what extent, and how the social technological specificity of Wikipedia and Wikia impact the memories, narratives, and practices shared on them. I also um, conducted a short test case study to just back up the findings from John Peel, and it was the decade 80s but I'm not going to share, because the findings are more or less match my general findings, so I'm not going to dive into this today. So, a um, brief overview of the related approaches in both web and memory studies. The new media approach is more or less related to the data body. So we are on the web and we leave traces. And these traces are used to profile us. Right? So you have the personal involuntary collective history that totally feedbacks and relates to search engine critic, and then you have emerging privacy issues. So this is the way you really would approach memory in terms of traces. Uh, the memory studies approach on the other hand, um, they say, okay, you have these memories and objects of memories outside in the real world, and they get mediated, remediated pre-mediated on the web. Um, what I would like to do instead, not to focus on what happens from the real world to the web, but I want to focus and zoom in on what happens on the web. Therefore, my approach to the analysis was a little bit different. First of all, I rely on empirically collected data. Second of all, I included, incorporated the critique that Manovich has on the remediation. Because he goes back to the confidential pioneers, Anki and Goldberg, and, and he says, well, web is a new medium with new properties. It doesn't remediate anything. I also rely on Richard Rogers' proposition that on the web we have natively digital objects that don't necessarily exist offline. So what do we do with them? Um, again, I took up on McLuhan, especially his vision of how the medium extends our cognitive processes, because it's pretty much appli appli applicable to the memory. And for memory studies, I borrowed the definition of what type of memory I'm going to look for. So I will be looking for individual, and I'm pretty aware that they're also collective and cultural <coughs> memories, and the way um, they get mutually shaped through media narratives and practices. The, my methodology was some kind of a mashup. So I got a theoretical model that was um, based on Eric Kettler's understanding that there are three agents in the web platforms as memory space, web platforms, users, and community. And I dived into qualitative and quantitative analysis. So for the web platforms, I did content analysis for users, purpose motivations, slash geolocation, and for the communities, I evaluated them on the basis of in-links and out-links of the platforms. So as I told you this morning, I went through several platforms. I, I went through blogs, Wikipedia, Wikia, and Facebook, and these are the results. More personal stories and opinions were available while gradually the witness accounts were edited out. Memories narratives are presented in third person encyclopedic style and they're threatened to be removed if they're not supported by an official source. This is accompanied by growing tendency towards referencing with official sources, news or magazine articles or books, or peers' biographies or citations. And very few are notes from the blogs that are dedicated to peer. 
The frequency of the egg is gross around October when it's the official anniversary of Peel's death and many festive vows and festivity occasions take place. Furthermore, the majority of the actors are located in Great Britain, suggesting that although the online web platform reach out beyond cultures and borders, the majority of the content creators for a particular topic share a common culture. Therefore, Peel's Wikipedia page predominantly extends the cultural memories of Peel and in many ways coincides with the evolution of Wikipedia as a medium with changing standards and norms in time. But on the other hand, immensely limits the visibility of the connectivity between various Peel's online memory spaces by not linking back to his blogs, Wikia and Facebook blog. So you can see here that um, this was an entry in 2006 that no longer really exists. It has been edited out. So this is why I named it Witness Point of View no longer finds its place on Wikipedia. Because we have to have the neutral point of view in here. But did you check whether the text appears before or after the infobox? Yes, I've traced all of them, all the uh, windows and history. Then, what I have here is the removal of unreferenced citation. It doesn't appear here. And if we happen to have a segment, it should be substantially referenced, as in here. So it's more or less the same, but we have an extensive reference in the Guardian as the official source. Well, this is my favorite finding, actually. So until 2008, this is the source of the entry for John Peel, and it had around 30 outlinks. In 2010, there were only three left. And uh, the sources have been switched. Now there's plenty of official notes, but not as much links. This is uh, from the Wikia, and um, I proceed with introducing. Oh, no, sorry. Second? Yes. So the wiki analysis has been carried out over the collaborative, collaboratively maintained John Peel wiki page by randomly sampling 100 articles from it. And the wiki analysis has been divided into three categories. The first one focuses on the content, the second one on memory, and the third refers to the contributors' motivation and purposes and their editing activity. The community, as the third agent of the social platforms, is memory spaces, is researched through in-links, outlinks of the Peel's Wikia page. And the Peel's Wikia data set incorporates personal, collective, and cultural narratives about Peel. So moreover, it enables a third agent of memories, Peel himself, cited through the transcriptions of his broadcasts. Unlike Wikipedia, <coughs> Wikia allows stories of Peel's impact over his audience together with eyewitness accounts. Similar to the blogs, the contributors extend the practices of listing tracks, music groups, programs to put various Peel activity in categories, attending concerts, playing records, commemorating and celebrating. The time of the contributions does not match the official Peel remembrance in October. Moreover, Peel Wiki's article established vast constellation of references, including personal sources, official ones, Peel citations, programs, transcripts, and blogs dedicated to Peel. So what we can see here is the program schedule that has been shared, which we can see it as a unique memory or commemorating practice that was enabled by Wikia. Um, here we can see some notes. What I like, this is 
these were like the most. This is how Peel remembers. And um, this is the transcript of his training shows. There is a quite vital, a really lively community that's organized on Kia, and you can find all kinds of sources that are shared amongst them. So, just to summarize the findings again, while Wikipedia disables or started disabling the individual memories and the witness accounts because we have to achieve a neutral point of view, because we have to use certain quality of references, Wikia actually enabled all kinds of unique memory practices that are unique to the web and don't really exist in the real world. And based on this finding, because remember to start with, Wikipedia and Wikia share the same social technological specificity, they have the, so, uh, the same software that enables them, I became more and more interested to actually study the memory dynamics in terms of technological specificity of the platforms, but also in terms of protocols, almost political protocols, that govern those platforms. So this is my proposal, what to do and how to go from, from here on. So I would like to suggest and propose a new medium-specific approach to study the dynamics of memory online and to map these dynamics within a platform and compare it across a platform. And this is my finding that actually different platforms, although being even technological similar like Wikipedia and Wikia, they rework memory in a very specific way. And finally, the mechanisms by which they undertake the reworking is embedded in the platform. So the platform enables it. And why am I suggesting this new approach? It is informed by several things. And this is the call of Parik and Samson, um, is a, the longer school of thought to move away from the representational analysis on the web and, fog, and avoid thinking of the effects of the medium rather than go back to McCullough and think what is actually the medium by itself. And it is also informed by Richard's proposition to try and find and work with methods that follow the natively digital objects, natively in terms of software. And also, um, I really like this proposition made by Kofi Fuller and McKenzie to explore the correlation of cultural practices, thought and intelligent devices. In memory studies, uh, there has been kind of growing concern um, that something happens on the web with the multimodalities and the data flows and let's explore their relationship and the way they impact the dynamics of memory online. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Questions please. Comments? Thank you very much for um, the, it was really big outlook you gave and I really like the theoretical part confirming the empirical part. I wonder, was wondering about your community concept because you were saying methodologically and this also follows Richard, uh, Roger's approach, you trace a community by inlink and outlinks of um, 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 the platform. Um, and I was wondering, although you, you start with you wanted to cross-platform analysis, because they are kind of different formats, Wikia and Wikipedia, as you said, they follow different protocols, different missions, stuff like this. So to look also at the overlap, not only of technology, but also of users. Um, so or um, how they inform each other also on this kind of way, which might not be traceably at first sight. 
on the level of code and data flow actually rework narratives and practices on the level of content. One more question. There's still time. One more question. Got value. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So if there's no questions, thanks again for the talk. <laughs>